All right, good morning. Yeah, welcome. Welcome to Grace. My name is Kenny. I have the privilege of being our lead pastor over at our Newburgh campus. Excited you all are here this morning, though, and uh, I'm excited to be here. It's not very often I get to come over to Washingtonville, but every time I do, it's a pleasure. So it's exciting to be here today. And uh, I just want to share with you real quick what we call our three hugs of grace. This is kind of speaks to the DNA and who we are as a church. And I love it because the first one is this, you are a gift to us. Whether you've been coming for the, you're here for the very first time, or you maybe you've been coming for a really long time, doesn't matter. You could be anywhere else today, but you're here this morning worshiping with us. You are a gift, so thank you. The second hug is this. This is a place where it's okay to not be okay. So maybe life has thrown you some curveballs this week and things just aren't right. I believe you are in the right place at the right time. It's okay if you're not okay, but we do not want you to stay in that not okay place. And that's why our third hug is that we love you enough here at Grace that we're going to share with you what we call the capital T truth. This is a person. His name is Jesus and his word. We're going to share truth today as well. So you, again, are, you're in the right place today. As we get started, can I pray with you? Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to be in this place this morning. Uh, to stand here, I don't take it lightly, you know that. And Lord, I pray that you'll use me as you would like, uh, speak through me and Again, as Pastor Jared often says, anything that is not from you today, Lord, I'll let it fall flat and let us forget about it. But Lord, everything that is from you, I pray that we would hold on tight to it and not just hear it today, but put it into practice today that we could be more like you. We love you. Use us, or speak to us now in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're talking about Advent and we're in this series, obviously, and Advent, I want to give you a definition for Advent this morning. It says, a time of expectant waiting, a preparation for both the celebration of the nativity of Christ at Christmas and the return of Christ at the second coming. And thinking about Advent, we often think about topics like love and joy and peace. And I know last week, Pastor Jim spoke to you all about uh, hope. And today I want to speak to you about faith, faith. Uh, and as I was preparing for the message and thinking on this and praying on this and just exploring scripture and what the Bible says about faith, you come to realize faith is a really big topic. Uh, we see it from cover to cover, Genesis to Revelation, people who live by faith and the Bible talks about faith and it's such a big thing. Uh, so to get started, what I want to do is I want to look at a couple of scriptures that give us really something really important that the Bible says about faith to give us, I guess, a basis for faith. And let's start in Hebrews chapter 11, verse one. It says, faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. And I love that definition. I love what that, that verse says. And it makes me think of even Pastor Jim's message uh, from last week. If you were here last week, you're gonna get this. If you weren't here last week, if you didn't hear this last week, I get to right now make a shameless push for you to go back and listen to this online and listen to the message because it's really good. But Pastor Jim used an illustration for hope and its connection to faith. And he was talking about a gentleman pushing a wheelbarrow across the falls on a tightrope and talked about faith is actually someone getting into that wheelbarrow and letting someone push them across. And hope is believing that you're going to get to the other side. Well, today we're talking about getting into that wheelbarrow, the faith that it takes just to step out and trust the Lord. And it's not something we see, but we have a hope for it. We have a hope for heaven, right? We have a hope, we're going to talk about, I mentioned it in the Advent definition, of Christ's return. I'm going to talk more about that in a little bit. That's a hope that we have. Faith is going to be the evidence of that hope, that faith that we have. Hebrews 11:6 says, and it is impossible to please God without faith. One thing I like to do is I like to ask questions I already know the answer to. Anybody else like that? <laughs> Scarier when you ask questions you don't know. It's just easier when you ask the questions you already know the answer. Like this, how many of you want to please God with your life? See, that's an easy question for me to ask because I think for the most part, I know the answer. I know what you're going to say. Yes, of course, I'm in church today. I want to please God with my life. This scripture tells us that, that without faith, 
It's going to be impossible to do that. So we're looking at faith today, and I want to look at it in two different ways. If you'll give me a chance here, we're going to look at it one through the lens of the Christmas story. Why wouldn't we? It's Christmas time. Faith through the lens of the Christmas story from Luke chapter 1. Then I want to do kind of something like Pastor Jared talks about, like a 5,000-foot view from Scripture, a big, broad view of faith and how there's application for that in our own lives. But to begin this morning, let's look at Luke chapter 1. And I'm going to really just talk you through the chapter, what's happening here, just give you some context, and we'll look at some verses. But to begin with in the story from Luke and the Christmas story, we actually start with a, a couple. They're named Zachariah and his wife Elizabeth. And Zachariah was a priest, and Scripture tells us that uh, he was at the temple performing his priestly duties, and he's in the sanctuary where only he was supposed to be. And he's met in the sanctuary by an angel, and it terrifies him. Now think about that. Have you ever been in a place where you're the only one that's supposed to be there, but then you, someone else shows up, and you're unexpected? Does it scare you as well? So we can understand, okay, of course, that's going to be a little bit terrifying. But then, of course, it's an angel, and that might freak you out a little bit as well. So we're, I can understand, I can get on board here, and he's terrified, but then the angel, Gabriel, gives Zechariah some incredible news, because the Bible tells us that Zechariah and his wife, Elizabeth, are getting up there in years. Actually, it says they are very old, and they had not had a child up to this point, but the news that the angel is delivering to him is, you guys are going to have a kid, and you're going to name him John, and he's going to prepare the way for the Messiah. Man, imagine how exciting that must have been. But also terrifying, right? And John or Zechariah's uh, response to the angel is he had an opportunity here, and it's, his response is really one of doubt rather than faith. He's like, I'm so old. <laughs> I have felt that way before. <laughs> I am, we're so old, how can this, this can't be true. Like really thinking, no way, this is impossible. Of course, we know with God, all things are possible, right? But he has doubt and the consequence to this doubt, which we often find in our own lives, there can be consequences to our lack of faith. You see that throughout scripture as well. But the angel tells Zechariah, because you did not believe, because you did not have faith in what I'm telling you, you are not going to speak for the next nine months until this child arrives. And I'll tell you, I've thought about that. And if any of you know me at all, you get to know me, I, I would love to get to know you. And I will tell you this, I am one that likes to talk. I don't shy away from a conversation. And I started to think, what would it be like to not speak for nine months? It would drive me crazy. But I think about all that Zechariah missed out on, the conversations with his wife about what God was doing, and you don't get to sit and talk about this. The people you'd want to tell, and now you can't tell, and all because of the consequences of you didn't have faith, because you doubted what the Lord was telling you. Man, it makes me think, how much in my life have I missed out on because of my lack of faith? I don't want to miss out on it anymore. I want, to be, I want to have great faith. Six months later, Scripture tells us that the same angel, he goes and visits this teenage girl named Mary. And similar story, Mary, you're going to have a child. Mind blown again. And she reacts in a similar way, but different way. She has questions, but her question isn't so much out of doubt, but out of curiosity. She's not asking, like, hey, how is this possible? But more question of long, like, hey, how is this going to happen? Like, I want to know. And the angel replies and just tells her, well, here's the thing. The Lord is going to come upon you, and he's going to do it. And then her response to that is in Luke 138. She says, I'm the Lord's servant, May everything about, everything you have said about me come true. Man, what a statement of faith, right? 
You are, you're telling me God's gonna do it, that's all I need. May everything else you're saying about me come true. I'm in. What if we responded that way? What if that's how we lived our life? Lord, whatever you wanna do, so be it, I'm in. Then God says, or the Bible tells us that Mary goes and he visits Elizabeth. And she's six months along now. She's getting close to that due date. John's about to arrive on the scene. And she's excited. They're both excited, probably nervous. And Mary, or Elizabeth says to Mary, you are blessed because you believe that the Lord would do what he said. Think about that for a second. She's blessed because of her faith. She's blessed because she believed God and what he said and that he would do what he said. She stepped out in faith and scripture tells us she's blessed because of that. We are blessed because of our faith. When you trust, when you will step out and let God do what he wants to do in your life, you will be blessed because of it. The word from the Lord resulted in faith. That faith resulted in action. Let me tell you, that's how you know your faith is real. When you say you have faith, but if it doesn't move you, you need to question whether or not you really have faith. Your faith should move you to action, to step out and trust and believe and do something with your faith. Now, as I mentioned, I also want to give you this big 5,000 foot view of faith from scripture. And I'm not going to start, I'm not going to go from Genesis to Revelation. Don't worry, you're welcome. Uh, but I do want to start about 2,000 years ago. And we're going to look at it in, in a way, talking about it. I, you guys are familiar with Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol? We're going to look at it past, present, future. Faith, past, present, future. No ghosts involved here. But first of all, if we think about it from the faith from the past, and we're looking about 2,000 years ago, we can have faith in what the Lord has done. Talking about faith in the Messiah, that the chosen one of God was prophesied about. We see that here in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. It says, all right then, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. So we see well before Jesus ever came, there was prophecy about him coming that we can believe what God said beforehand. We should believe, have faith in how God was moving in the past. We can believe in the virgin birth. Here's the thing. I can say we can believe in the virgin birth because that often trips people up. But I'll, let me just tell you, <laughs> I'm going to fully confess something to you. I don't completely understand how it works. Anybody else with me? I know I'm not the only one. I ask questions I already know the answer to. Remember, to say that I know how the virgin works, I'm not God. It's a miracle, okay? But here's one thing. I don't know if they know understand how to still believe that it did. They're they're. They're exclusive. I can believe in the virgin birth without understanding the how if I understand who God is. If I understand that he is all powerful, there's, that there's nothing that he can't do, then I can believe in the virgin birth. I can trust him for that. And here's the thing. If he's not all powerful, he's not a very good God to begin with. But he is. He is all powerful and he is good. So once we've established faith in the coming of Jesus, that he is the Messiah, that he came, we have to have faith also in the purpose with which he came. Understand, he didn't come just to come, but he came with a purpose. Matthew 121 says, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. That's why he came, to do what nobody else could do. Scripture, we know, tells us that he did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus even said in his own words in Mark 1 15, he says, repent of your sins and believe the good news. He's imploring each and every one of us, repent of our sins 
and believe or have faith, trust in the good news. So then we have to ask ourselves, well, what is this good news that I'm supposed to have faith in or that I'm supposed to believe in? Well, it starts with Jesus' birth. His birth was good news. We know that from Luke chapter two when the angels came and Jesus had just been born and there's these angels in the sky coming to visit some shepherds and they say, behold, I bring you glad tidings or good news of great joy that is for all people. The Messiah has been born this day. That's good news. Again, that's past. It was good news, right? It's good news for then, but it's also good news for now. His death, hard to think about a death being good news, but the death of Jesus is good news, especially for you and for me. Romans 3, 23 says that we've all sinned and we all fall short of the glory of God. Every single one of us. Online, in this room, doesn't matter. We all fall short. And there's consequences to that sin. Romans 6, 23 tells us that the wages of of sin or the cost for your, your sin, my sin, is death. And that is an eternal separation from God forever. So the penalty because we've sinned is death. We deserve hell. But the verse doesn't end there. I'm so thankful for that. The wages of sin is death, but, best but in the Bible, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Man, that's great news, right? Not only that, it doesn't stop there because he didn't stay dead. If we're talking about just death in itself, it's not good news because until he rose again. And his resurrection makes it great news. If he died but he only, and he stayed dead, he's no different than any other religious leader that's ever lived. But he's not like every other religious leader that's ever lived. He's God. He is the Messiah. And he didn't stay dead, but he rose again that third day. That's great news. And that leads us to Romans 10, 9, and 10. This culmination of all of this says, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That is why he came. For it is by believing in your heart that you're made right with God and it's by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. So when we're talking about faith and believing what God has done, what God has done is pay the price for you and for me so that we can know salvation. We can have faith in that. We can trust that. And that leads us to faith in the present. That's faith in what the Lord is doing. Because I believe he's doing something right here, right now. I hope in you and through you. Romans 1.16, look what Paul says. He says, for I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ, it is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes. The Jew first and also the Gentile. The good, this good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. As the scriptures say, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. You wanna be right with God? Of course you do. That's why you came to church today. You wanted to do the right thing. All right, that's my, I mean, not why you came, but <laughs> you can't work your way to this righteousness. It's faith. You believe. You want to have, be right with God, you have to have faith. Just like that verse, we have to please God. It, we want to please God, it's by faith. This makes me think of Ephesians 2, 8, 9. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. No patting yourself on the back here. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things that we've done so that none of us can boast about it. But the next verse, verse 10 says, for we are God's masterpiece. Man, I love that. 
He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do good things presently he pl- that he planned for us long ago. He was thinking about you today long before you ever did. And when you were ready to trust him and you put your faith in him, he had good, plan- good things already planned for you to be doing currently. Will you trust him for that? I like how Tim Keller talks about this. He says, if we say, I believe in Jesus, but it doesn't affect the way we live, the answer is not now we need to add hard work to our faith so much as that we haven't truly understood or believed in Jesus at all. It's a great quote. Think on that. Are you sure you've truly understood and believed in Jesus at all? If so, it should move you to good works. That's what salvation does. It moves us there. It doesn't start there. Our salvation starts in faith. His grace, his mercy, we trust it, and it moves us to act. James chapter two speaks to this. Verse 14 says, what good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing and you say, goodbye, have a good day, stay warm, eat well, but then you don't give that person any food or clothing, what good does that do? So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. And understand, this isn't going against what we saw in Ephesians. This isn't saying that we have good works for salvation. It says, because I am saved, because I'm a follower of Jesus, because I've placed my faith in the person and the work of Jesus Christ, I now am moved to do something. And if I'm not moved to do something, like Keller says, I have to maybe think of whether or not I was ever saved to begin with. So do you see your faith being lived out in your own life? Do you see these good works at play? Give you some examples of what this could look like. Spiritual habits. If you're a follower of Jesus, you should be developing spiritual habits in your life. Acts chapter two, the early church, uh, Acts 2.42 talks about the, the believers devoting themselves to prayer, devoting themselves to fellowship, devoting themselves to the study of God's word. Does that what, is that what your, your faith looks like? Faith is also engaging our community. I love what you guys are doing here in Washingtonville with these Christmas gifts. There's still opportunity to participate today to let your good works be lived out by helping kids who maybe wouldn't otherwise have Christmas have Christmas. That is faith on display in a real practical way. If you've not yet signed up, man, scan that QR code, get involved. Acts of generosity inside and outside of the church. I also think of Galatians chapter five, talking about the fruit of the spirit. We're talking about love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That is evidence that the spirit of God lives in you. That is those things are played out in your life and are evident in your life. That is your faith on display. Examples from scripture that we see from Uh, from Hebrews 11, tells us that Abel brought an offering to the Lord. It was an act of faith. Man, I think when we participate in the kicking the darkness offering, it's an act of faith. Bible says Noah obeyed God and he built a boat. I love that because there was never a need for a boat before. Like a boat, (laughs) what's a boat? What's an ark? He didn't question it. God said, do it, Noah did it. Do we live our lives, does our faith look like that? God says it, I do it. Says by faith, Moses chose God over Egypt, meaning that he chose to share in the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. Man, in our world today, everywhere we turn, there is offerings of pleasures of sin, left and right. 
our faith says that we can choose to reject that and go with God. The decision is yours. And when we choose God's way, that is our faith on display. I see throughout scripture, God accomplishing great things through the faith of ordinary people. And I see that right here in this room. Ordinary people, and God wants to do extraordinary things in and through our faith. Not as a show of, hey, look at me. Look how awesome I am. Look what I've done for the Lord. Man, I'm good. God's got to be so glad he has me on his team. No, it's not that kind of attitude. It's, man, look at what he is doing. He gets the glory because of what he is doing, because he's doing it in and through me. Paul says in Galatians 2.20, my old self has been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me, present. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And that leads us to a faith for the future. When we hold on to that, we see that not only does God, we, do we have faith in what God ha, the Lord has done, not only what he is doing, because he is doing currently, hopefully in us and through us, but then that allows us to build and have faith for what the Lord is going to do. Because I love it. I think he still has more in store for each and every one of us. Let's think back to that Christmas story, Luke chapter one. Mary, she was able to trust and have faith in what was about to come in her life. Because the angel told her that the Lord is coming on you. He is going to do this thing. But there's one verse I didn't share with you before that I want to share with you now. Something that Gabriel said to her, and I love this. In verse 37, he says, For the word of God will never fail. Man, as soon as... Gabriel said, the word of God will never fail. That's when Mary stepped up, very next verse, and she's like, let everything you've said about me come true then. Do we feel that way about God's word? This will never fail me. It will never fall short. It's never gonna make a mistake. I can trust this so much that when I put my faith in what the Lord has said, I can step out and have great faith knowing he will never fail me. Think about it. What is it that you won't attempt for God if you know he won't fail? What is it that you will say, hey, I can be obedient to whatever this says because I know it won't fail? Will you let that move your faith today? To trust that today? I also mentioned earlier that Advent, it's the expectant coming of Christ the first time, but it's also the expectant coming of Christ the second time. And that is that future that we can hope and have faith that he will come again. Scripture speaks to this in 1 Thessalonians 4, starting in verse 15. It says, we tell you this directly from the Lord. We who are still living when the Lord returns will not meet him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God. First, the believers who have died will rise from their graves. Then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. Man, that's exciting to know that that's something we get to look forward to, something to expect, something that is going to happen. Scriptures talk about this day that the Lord's coming is going to be like a thief in the night. That's something that nobody is ready for, that nobody knows the day, the time, or the hour with which Christ is going to come. But what we can know, because we know this will never fail, that he is coming. And we will meet the Lord in the air. 
those who have placed their faith and their trust in Christ for salvation. We'll meet him in the air. This is a day to look forward to, a day to have faith in, a day to expect. Hebrews chapter 12, 1 and 2 says, therefore, and I'm going to pause right there and give a nod to Pastor Abe right here of Washingtonville because I know Anytime I feel like I hear Pastor A preach and he comes to a verse that says, therefore, he reminds us that when we see therefore, we're supposed to ask, what is the therefore, therefore? (laughs) Right? So, therefore, it's a nod to what's happening in Hebrews chapter 11, a chapter full of faith. And because that's there, therefore, let it, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, says, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance to the future, right? The race that God has set before us. We can run that race into the future. We can run with endurance into the future by faith, Because of verse two, it says, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Other versions of scripture refer to that author, initiator and perfecter of our faith. It says author and finisher or founder and perfecter of our faith. Our faith, your faith, my faith, it begins with God. He is the initiator of that faith. It starts with him. And I have to believe, I would love to believe that maybe one of you today, maybe God is initiating faith right here, right now. Maybe you've come in today and you've been kind of reluctant kind of hesitant to really put your faith and your trust in Jesus and let him be Lord and leader of your life. But today, maybe because you've understood the good news and maybe you've understood it for the first time, really, that he is initiating faith in your life. That's a good thing. Let him do that good work in you. Faith, it starts with faith in the past Faith in what the Lord has already done, that death, that burial, and that resurrection of Jesus, it begins there. And that leads us to a faith in the present and believing that God has not done. He's doing something today and he wants to do something in you and through you. He wants to do your good works in you and through you for his glory. And as that faith grows, it leads us to a faith for the future, knowing that he is coming back, but he's not done yet. I'll tell you, during Jesus' life here on earth, we see two things in the life of Christ, in the the Gospels, two times in Jesus' life that he was amazed by something. Twice it happened. And I thought about that, and I thought, to me, that's amazing because knowing that Jesus is God, King of kings, Lord of lords, creator of all things, He was there from the very beginning. It's hard to imagine that he would really be amazed by anything. Yet scripture tells us he was amazed twice. One being by a man's lack of faith. By the lack of faith, he was amazed. And the second one was by a man's great faith. He was amazed. And I think about that and I just want to ask you one question and I'm going to pray. Which one are you? Do you have lacking faith or do you have great faith? Either way, if you are lacking faith, it can change today. If you'll let him initiate that faith in you and through you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word today. I thank you for faith. You're the starter. You're the founder, the author of it. Lord, I thank you for beginning that in me. 
Lord, I pray for each one of us today as we live out our faith, if we are in faith, if we've trusted you with our faith, Lord, help us to live it out today in a way that is real and tangible and makes a difference and impacts people because that's what you've called us to. That's what you want to do in us and through us. Lord, help us to live that out in a way that honors you and glorifies you and just lifts up your name. God, I pray that for the one that may be here and they're struggling with faith, struggling with whether or not they believe, God, I pray that you will move them today to trust, to place their faith in you and what you have done. That, uh, that they would understand it has nothing to do with what they can do or have done, but it's all about you, Jesus. And Lord, help us lean into the future, run this race of endurance, expecting and ready for your return. And Lord, to you be the glory, now and forever. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.